Welcome to Supply Chain Now, the voice of global supply chain. Supply Chain Now focuses on the best in the business for our worldwide audience, the people, the technologies, the best practices, and today's critical issues, the challenges and opportunities. Stay tuned to hear from those making global business happen right here on Supply Chain Now. Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Scott Luton here at Supply Chain Now. Welcome to today's show. So on today's show, we're going to be talking with a food industry expert to get a better handle on how the supply chains behind eggs work and why the heck are we seeing these prices for eggs so sky high. In fact, consumers saw average uh, average egg prices, try to say that three times fast, in the U.S. increase some 60% in 2022. So how do we get here and what lies ahead? Join us in a great show here today on Supply Chain Now. So outstanding guest here today. Let me share a little bit about him. He brings more than 25 years of work experience in the food industry to the table, no pun intended, from grill clerk to stock clerk and purchasing manager, all the way to VP of grocery at a big uh, food retailer. Since 2016, our guest has been a board member, a co-founder, and advisor to over two dozen food retail and CPG enterprises. He's been featured in all the big publications from Forbes to New York Times, The Guardian, amongst other media outlets. And get this, he guest lectures in a little bit of free time, I guess, at Yale, Rice, Stanford, and other, and other uh, educational institutions. So join me in welcoming Errol Schweizer. Errol, how you doing? I'm doing great, Scott. Happy to be here. Well, uh, thank you for carving some time out. I really have enjoyed your perspective and expertise on a variety of things, including the egg industry. And I tell you, with your background, uh, it's good to have experts here really informing our audience of what's going on. So thanks for the time here today. Yeah, my pleasure. All right. So before we get into the heavy hitting topics, you know, we like to kind of get a better sense of our guests here. So let's start with uh, where did you grow up, Errol? Bronx, New York, 10467, right near the zoo and the botanical garden. Uh, product okay. of the uh, New York City public school system and the uh, State University, City University of New York. Man, okay, you got all the credentials uh, growing <laughs> up in, in, in that part of the woods. Let me ask you, so let's talk sports. A little pre-show, you were telling me you're a big-time Yankees fan and Knicks fan. Is that right? I am, and it's alternate ecstasy and heartbreak, depending on the team. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to tell Particularly you. Particularly being a Knicks fan, but this season's been a little better. Well, I agree. Uh, you, I think uh, y'all played our Atlanta Hawks uh, uh, three or four times, and, and your uh, Knicks are a tough team to handle, as always. But even worse, at least from Atlanta's perspective, uh, in the 90s, man, the Yankees reigned on our Atlanta Braves parade more than once. I'll always remember the 96 World Series, which was uh, uh, Andrew Jones' rookie season, and the Braves had a Two games to one lead, and and um, y'all had a catcher, uh, and and his name escapes me right minute. But he hit like a three run home run off Mark Wallers, turned the series around. And y'all went on to win, I think, in six games. So uh, and breaking our hearts while you did that. But what's yeah? Of I all, think that all was those, a Jeter's rookie season too. I think you may be right. Um, and uh, I'm gonna I gotta think of that catcher's name, Layritz, Jim Layritz. Oh, Jim Layritz, yeah, right on. <laughs> Man, it broke our hearts. Old well, hey, so of all those, you know, of all those uh, title teams that the Yankees had throughout the '90s uh, and 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 really since in the 2000s, you name it, what's one of your favorite players? Man, I really just love the squad with Mariano Rivera and Paul O'Neill. Um, just you know that, that that late '90s, early 2000s. But I also have a soft spot for um, growing up in the 80s in New York and the Don Mattingly, Dave Winfield era, even though we, we never won. But I still have a, a 31 Winfield shirt, uh, always been a Mattingly fan. So um, I sort of pivot between those two because that was very emotional back then and we could never really mm-hmm. figure it out. And then obviously in the you know, late 90s, early 2000s, when you know, it was the best team in the world. No kidding, man. And Mariano uh, Rivera, or Rivera was like one of the, if he's not the best closer of all time, um, just the the ultimate professional, Mister Consistency, man. Yeah. Uh, very jealous of all those teams, but I digress. Let's let's switch gears a minute because I could talk. We could talk Yankees, Braves, baseball. I think for a long time. Um, let's talk. I about do want to profession- point out that Hank Aaron is the best baseball player of all time, and he was a Brave. So. Yes, and still in my book, I'm partial the true home run king. 
I, I agree. I think he's the, the numbers <laughs> king, the home run king. Man. Much respect to Henry Aaron. Amen. And what and what he bat- battled back then, the death threats and all the hate, and to be able to go out there and compartmentalize and still perform as a professional, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm with you. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, okay. I knew we could we could make this a baseball uh, three-hour podcast, but putting that aside, I, I love your background. Again, I, I really appreciate you carving some time out as busy as you are. Um, tell us a little bit about your background. I kind of I kind of put it at a high level in the intro, you know, from, um, how'd you put it, um, from grill clerk, which I can relate. I've worked in restaurants from, for four and a half years through college, all the way up to the executive level and all points in between. Tell us a little about uh, that journey. Yeah, I, I started out actually 30 years ago, come to think of it, um, just working food service in college. Um, you know, prior to that, I'd been, you know, a lifeguard and, you know, you know, working at day camps or other odd jobs you do as a teenager. But I really took the food service in college to, um, you know, help with tuition and, you know, have some spending money. Um, I, I made sandwiches. I was a grill cook, line server. I mean, I did everything in the dining halls. And then I started working at a little uh, volunteer-run food co-op um, on, on campus um, that was, you know, pretty poorly staffed. And, you know, at the time, I adopted some lifestyle changes and tried to start eating a little healthier. You know, I grew up mm. in the Bronx. And, um you know, in the 80s in the Bronx, you know, it's, you know, pizza and Chinese food and McDonald's and, uh, <laughs> you know, plenty of grocery stores. It wasn't a, you know, quote, food desert by any means, but, um, you know, there wasn't a lot of healthy options. So I started, you know, I started educating myself when I was in college about mm-hmm. how to eat better and, um, you know, inspired me to start working in, you know, national organic food stores. And I had a lot of odd jobs in my 20s. Um, me and my wife were just joking about it. I, I had a hard time holding down a job and commitments, but one mm-hmm. thing, that was consistent for me was working at farmers markets. I did CSA work. I kept doing food jobs, retail, food service. I worked in warehouses and supply chain. I was an EMT for a while, including um, a short stint at Yankee Stadium as an EMT, um, but kept coming back to food um, and worked at a number of retailers until I found my way to Whole Foods. Um, and they hired me um, at entry level, uh, even though you know, I had a college degree, um, all this experience, but they had an opening on the grocery team, even though I asked for produce. And um, I just started out as a stock clerk, stocking the drink box, um, helping with overnight inventories, fronting and facing the store throughout the day, uh, helping with customer service. And, you know, I kind of took to it. Um, you know, I'm pretty good at basic arithmetic, you know, eighth grade math, you know, a little <laughs> algebra, you know, it's kind of what you need for, uh, <laughs> you know, ordering and, you know, restocking groceries. I'm, I'm okay with a spreadsheet, you know, I was able to, you know, track sales and gross margin. I kind of educated myself to that. You know, I'm a, I'm a biology major and I, you know, I, I've studied a little bit of history and economics, but I never took a business class. And so I just learned by doing mostly so I didn't get fired. You know, I wanted to make sure that we were, you know, maximizing our sales and profitability. And at the time, you know, I started at Whole Foods uh, in Florida, and we were competing with Publix. Still, they still compete with Publix, and Publix is a great retailer. Right, and but time, I think Publix, you know, I think Publix is based in Florida, right, Arrow? Yeah, like when Florida, and they they've always sold organic food. Um, they're you know they're partially employee owned, so they've got a really committed staff, um, and they monopolize you know large segments of Florida, fifty plus percent of market share. So I had to be very careful about pricing and assortment. Um, so I learned um, you know to be competitive, but also collaborative and, you know, you know, helping my, uh, coworkers, you know, learn the ropes, you know, obviously it's always a team effort to stock shelves. You know, we'd get a truck in, uh, you know, 1500, 2000 cases. And we had between, you know, four of us, you know, three or four hours to knock that out, you know, until the customers came in. And so I got used to stocking 75 to hundred cases an hour, got really good with a box cutter a, you know, pallet jack, a forklift, a, a cardboard baler, you know, all, all the fun stuff, right? Errol, I got to I gotta chime in here because, you know, for um, about a year and a half, maybe two years, my, well, my first job ever at $4.35 an hour was my local Winn-Dixie yeah. uh, grocery store in Aiken, South Carolina. And you just walked me through all my memories. And I got to tell you, <laughs> you, know, you and your team was a lot more efficient than me, than me and the, the team I was on. So, um, anyway, please continue. You're talking about well, kind you know, of your Whole background. Foods always looks so crunchy, but that first week I got there, one of the guys on my team says, "You know, don't don't listen to the, the hype. These these folks are ball breakers. You got to work. You got to work." And he was right, and we did. 
Um, and so, yeah, I, I learned the ropes and um, I just, after six months, started applying for promotions. I started applying all over the country, um, got, got rejected from most of them <laughs> until I finally got an offer to move to Austin to help open the flagship Lamar store where they, they hired me in as a, a world food section buyer. Um, and I was actually partially a regional buyer too. I worked out of the regional office um, and had assistant uh, manager responsibilities in the store as well. Um, so I did that for a couple of years and then, you know, learned the ropes, uh, figured it out, and then started applying for regional buyer positions. And I actually ended up getting two offers and um, my wife convinced me to take the one back home in New York. Mm. And so uh, for a while, I was the regional buyer and regional grocery director in Whole Foods Market, New York City, New Jersey, Long Island, Westchester, wow. Connecticut area. So if you're a big role. The city. A lot of, oh, I went from having the responsibility over, you know, a, a team that was doing, you know, 300, maybe $400,000 a week to a team that was doing, you know, 15, uh, you know, $150 million a year, mm. $200 million a year by the time I left. And, you know, with everything else, I was focused on maximizing sales and profitability through selling really good food. Um, and so, I learned about category management, a bit about supply chain. I learned quite a bit about pricing strategy and promotional strategy. I worked with dozens, probably hundreds of local suppliers to merchandise their products. I negotiated um, or helped our national team negotiate deals with national suppliers and um, added about 350 basis points of margin, um, including a good growth in top line sales. And I was asked to apply for a role back in Austin to work on the national team. And was that and, the... Um, was that ultimately the VP of grocery role? No, that, that was sort of the assistant global coordinator role. Um, I would give a shout out to my friend and mentor, Perry Abenante, who um, was the uh, global coordinator, quote, you know, VP of grocery at the time and uh, recruited me and mentored me. And then uh, he took a better opportunity and um, I was asked to apply for his job, which I did. And then I did that role for seven years. Okay. Um, so I was at the, by the time I left, I grew it from about 1.8 to about five billion in sales with my team. Um, added about 250 to 300 basis point gross margin. But in the meantime, what we did was we we launched dozens, probably hundreds of products into household names. Uh, we developed supply chains, you know, really specialized, uh, unique supply chains on non-GMO, um, organic, and regenerative, as well as working with kosher and halal suppliers, plant-based, grass-fed. We, we really focused on um, ethically and impact-motivated entrepreneurs and cooperatives. We did a ton of negotiation with Big CPG, too. I've sat across the table from all, you know, Nestle, M&M Mars, General Mills, Kellogg's, Coke, Pepsi, you name it. Not afraid of that scene, um, but it wasn't what inspired <laughs> me, right? You know, I liked right. working with the folks who had a great idea, um, had a great cause, and a great product to make them into national suppliers, which we did for, for many products. And then, um, you know, economy changed, the uh, industry changed, and I'm a very opinionated New York Jew. And uh, <laughs> we decided to part ways. I've, I'm still on great terms with Whole Foods and my friends there. Um, and I've been a board member, advisor, consultant, you name it, for about two dozen retailers, mostly indie retailers, CPG, uh, packaged food companies, startups, emerging brands, some investors. I've worked on uh, everything from you know chapter seven, chapter eleven turnarounds to you know starting up a company from scratch um, into emerging brands, and still continue to do that to this day. So it's it's my love and my passion. We're gonna get into the egg industry in a minute, but but just give us a couple things. Um, you know, like in tw here in twenty twenty three, January twenty twenty three, when we're recording this, of course it'll be released in February. But uh, what's a couple things that are going on right now in the food industry that that um, it, you feel like we should set the table with, perhaps? Well, I mean, I, I love the uh, topic of the podcast, supply chain. I mean, I don't think anybody outside the food industry really thought about food supply chain before, you know, March of 2020, maybe even April of 2020, right? Um, and even then, the, 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 the effects of what happened in that time frame were delayed uh, by a bit. Um, and what we went through was this cycle of um, the economy kind of stopped, you know, uh, just about three years ago, uh, particularly food service, and then restarted, jump-started uh, in the midst of a pandemic. And so not only did we see, you know, obviously in the food industry, really, really horrible things like you know, food workers died 
and hundreds of thousands got infected mm. and got sick. Uh, but we saw rapidly changing erratic consumption patterns. You know, I come out of category management and supply chain, and you watch your sales religiously so that you can detect and react to patterns. And it's a lot of what predictive analytics and a lot of the tools we use to, you know, replenish our shelves and determine what else we need to be carrying and what is what is not uh, being sold. And that all blew up, and it continues to blow up. But it, that was the first time in, in my experience, and I had been working at the time for two different retailers, that um, you didn't have a basis to compare to figure out what you needed to sell um, and how much of. And this is before any pricing crisis. This is just sure. this is just replenishment. This is just determining what people want to buy. And you know, you start seeing trend reports come out three years ago about oh, comfort foods and you know key national brands and people, you know, are, are snacking at home because they're working from home or they're not commuting as much. And so trying to react to that, um, people are wanting to take better care of themselves. You saw a big boost in organic sales and non-GMO sales. You saw a huge boost in plant-based sales. Um, and so that all started happening. But on the other hand, the supply chains themselves were, were built on a foundation of spreadsheets, you know, and a lot of us have dealt with the, you know, just in time, um, style supply chain management sure. where you're having to manage inventory really tight to watch your cash flow, to keep a focus on profitability, ultimately towards better bottom line performance, which means on a good day, you're, you'd rather go out of stock on something than actually keep it in, in, in stock if it means that you're spending too much to do so, right? Um, and so when you multiply that by a billion across you know, you know how many transactions are happening on a daily basis in this country in the food industry, you end up with what happened, which was um, out of stocks and log jams, where the supply chain was built for productivity and efficiency, but it was inflexible um, and it was fragile. You know, the, the notion of fragility versus anti-fragility was very helpful sure. for me in understanding what was happening here. Um, and a friend of mine who's been in it longer than me was like, yeah, just in time was built for the, the CFOs, <laughs> and, <laughs> which is actually not true <laughs> when you read about what it was, what it, how it's been done in Japan. It, it actually right. wasn't, it was built for, um, it was actually built for anti-fragility and here the way it was adapted. So what that meant by, you know, six, eight, nine months later, you started seeing stuff really go out of stock, like really big problems with delays um, and then compound that with, you know, weather events like here in Austin, exactly two years ago, we had a really deep freeze. Um, and it took, you know, even well-prepared retailers like HEB is probably the best retailer in the country on that sort of stuff. It took them weeks to recover. It took Whole Foods many weeks to recover. Y'all, y'all might've had some Waffle Houses that went down for a little while, which never happened that uh, never two happens. years ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. uh, Waffle House is the ultimate resilient supply right. chain. <laughs> so it, it, it affected everybody, but it was these compounding effects, right? And so then supply, demand, um, as well as you know, challenges with uh, illness and then turnover where people working in the supply chain, people like us who came up through the ranks, but also people in those ranks were like, I don't know if I'm getting paid enough for this shit. <laughs> Pardon mm. my French. Like, um, it was stressful. It was hard for folks. And you started seeing a lot of turnover. Uh, you started seeing a lot of folks going for other jobs. Um, you got, you started people seeing people ask for, for raises and, you know, uh, what I feel is a welcome boost in interest in unionization that people were willing to actually stand up and ask for more and better. Mm. Um, but that was yet another factor that impacted the supply chain and then impacted uh, prices, right? Um, I also want to point out that early in the pandemic, you saw the first wave of pandemic, what we call pandemic profiteering by big retail conglomerates and CPG conglomerates. You know, with this boost in supply chain, this huge jump in sales with, you know, the, you know, uh, that food service was quiet, wouldn't shut down. Everybody was eating at home, cooking right. at home. I mean, the retailers had a bonanza, especially the bigger retailers. Huge sure. boost, not, not only in gross margin dollars, but you saw a big boost in the gross margin rate as well. Um, and so, you know, obviously that made the shareholders happy, made the investors and some of the executives happy, but it created the expectation that retailers were going to keep producing this type of profitability, right? And so when you started- It gets addictive, seeing, right? It gets, oh, yeah. I mean, you know, <laughs> gross margin, it's crack, right? You know, it's just- you, you want to keep getting more and more, and you have to be very careful uh, with your unit economics, right? When, you know, it's obviously that's the whole elasticity, um, you know, equation. So 
what then started happening with the supply chain stuff and you know the push into profitability, you know, labor issues, uh, you started seeing prices start increasing, particularly in highly consolidated sectors. It really started out in the meat poultry sector first, to the point where like it became like a federal issue after six months. Um, you know, meat poultry, it's you know, it's like four or five firms control like eighty percent of the market. Right. You know, it's it's an oligopoly, you know, just straight out of the dictionary. Yeah, and it's and it's interesting. I think on the consumer side with some of the scary things that you hadn't seen. Most people haven't seen their life their lifetime here in the States of some empty shelves or empty coolers oh, yeah. or what have you. Once it was available, it was like it was, you can get it all you could. And they were and, and what went with that mindset, at least from what I've I've observed and what I perceived, is that fear of missing out, you were going to pay those higher prices and just keep paying it as you're getting through that stretch of the of especially the pandemic. Because there was a lot there was a lot of fear in general. Um, and that that uh, my hunch would be that helped sustain that um, the, those profit margin maximization efforts that you were speaking to, right? So you, you had it on the, the the corporate or the industrial side in terms of the initiatives, and then the market was embracing it based on kind of the the psyche of the consumer, I'll call it. So you're um, and all of this may be. Is there anything else before we move into the egg industry? Anything else you think really as as where we are today? Any other background topic you want to bring to the front before we talk eggs? Yeah, just to put a bow on the pricing discussion, what you've seen, particularly in the last 18 months, is that behavior, which we would probably refer to as price signaling, where retailers, um, CPG companies, you know, even investors were all like, hey, now is the, quote, inflationary time. If you're going to move on price, move on price now. Put put out a price change. And I was talking to a colleague, a, fr- a long-term friend who works at a grocery store locally, and he was just saying, where they usually change price tags once a month or changing price tags weekly because they're getting all these price increases from their wholesaler who's getting all those price increases from all the brands. And now where I think think things got out of control is that a lot of folks um, double dipped and sort of increased the rate of retail over the rate of cost increase, which is you know the, the, the profiteering, the margin grab. And that's how you ended up with um, where we're at now with these really high prices. And, you know, there's some analyses, economic analyses, that have pointed out that about 50% of the price increases are just that profit margin, as opposed wow. to the pass-through from cost to retail. Mm. So you know, not to say that, you know, there obviously are a lot of very real reasons why prices have gone up well over the rate of, uh, of, of wages, by the way. Mm. I believe it's you know, the overall uh, inflation is at least 200 basis points higher than the rate of wage increase. Wow. So that difference is the profiteering. And, you know, I think it was Q3, uh, profits were the highest ever. It was like uh, $2 trillion in corporate profits. Wow. And when you look at the companies, and I've documented this in my Forbes articles pretty extensively. Um, and so where, where we're at now is there, <laughs> is we are now continuing to pay those those prices that you know the shareholder buybacks and dividends those those checks have been cut to investors and shareholders but those prices are not coming down man Errol so much to ask you about so little time I really I feel I feel like I've gained a certification through uh, hearing your take on you know all your almost 30 years in the food industry and kind of walking us through all that um, let's talk eggs Um so now that you've kind of given us a, a macro uh, perspective of what's going on across the food industry, especially in the last two or three years, even up to right now, uh, of course, as I mentioned on the front end, eggs, generally speaking, on average, for consumers here in the U.S., I think we're up 60% in 2022. Um, and we're still, I still see it in my, on my social media, <laughs> all my, my family and my friends are all talking about the price of eggs. So what factors have been impacting the egg industry here lately? Yeah, eggs are real interesting because um, they, you know, come from an animal um, and yet are kind of treated in in grocery stores more like a packaged product um, as opposed to, you know, a fresh product or, you know, uh, you know, piece of meat or um, or even milk. I, I consider eggs to be a very different type of category. Um, and so the the numbers are raised, you know, I, I've, I've seen, you know, Bureau of Labor Statistics say 60%, IRI says 80%. Um, you know, I've seen even higher numbers. Eggs are you know, multi-segmented categories. So there's a lot of different prices you're going to see. But what all eggs have in common are actually the supply chain factors that um, create these, you know, no pun intended, layers of cost of 
you know, how the price is actually calculated. Um, and, you know, the main factor in, you know, influencing supply now was um, the avian flu, um, which primarily impacts high density operations, or what we call factory farms. You know, that's, that's why you've seen these operations with you know, 10,000, 100,000 birds have to be culled. And ultimately, they've had to cull like over 60 million birds, which is really astronomical and horrifying mm. idea that they've, you know, suffocated or buried alive or, or cooked alive, you know, all these birds because they find one instance of avian flu in a flock, that whole flock's going down because mm. it's so uh, virulent. Um, and so it's really horrifying. And, you know, I would say the one... Lucky thing is we haven't seen any kind of avian flu jump to people at this point. We're, we're still in the midst of the, um, you know, the COVID-19 stuff. The last thing we need is some uh, H5N1, right. H1N1, uh, or whatever the, uh, the strain is of avian flu. Hmm. All right. So, you know, that's sort of the context. Um, and so eggs, you know, there's a farm. And that farm is not always our pastoral fantasy. It's usually a very large barn with, you know, tens of thousands of hens crowded into, uh, you know, it's, you know, a large space, you know, laying eggs, you know, there's, there's workers who go about gathering the eggs, there's conveyor belts that, you know, that are transporting the eggs so that they could be uh, washed and sorted, um, and then packed. Um, and then, you know, the eggs get picked up and they get sent somewhere else, right? And so anytime you, you touch, or you move something, there's costs associated with it, right? And so um, let's start with the chickens themselves. The main okay. factor in the price of eggs, believe it or not, is actually feed. Um, and depending on the type of egg, how it was produced, where it was produced, um, what was fed, feed could be 50 to 75% of the price of that egg, period. Really? So if you want to watch the price of eggs, the other thing to watch on a regular basis is the price of feed, primarily corn, little to a lesser extent, soy. Uh, my team at Whole Foods used to buy feed. So um, I, like I said, I'm not an economist, but you know, I I, I can, um, you know, survive by pretending to be one day to day. Um, we used to watch the CME, you know, we, we used to watch feed pricing. We used to negotiate with feed suppliers. And on the other hand, now I also watch, you know, the prof- profitability of feed suppliers too, of, you know, grain commodity markets, you know, grain uh, speculating is highly unregulated uh, or I would say misregulated in the U S mm. you've seen huge profits from Archer Daniels Midland and Cargill and Bunge. Uh, and Dreyfus, what we call the A, B, C, and D of grain trading. Um, and that influences, yeah. uh, impacts feed pricing. You know, So feed pricing has been very high um, you know, in and of itself, even outside of the avian flu. Um, so that's probably the second largest impact to um, the egg prices now. So if which I'm, is, if, go ahead. So Errol, if I'm following along here, uh, the type of, of uh, bird that's producing the egg is a big factor. And then the feed, the type of feed they're using... Uh, to produce a particular type of egg is a really big factor. Is that right? Yeah, in terms of the type of bird and the type of feed, you know, you have um, conventional eggs, you know, usually from a concentrated animal feedlot, you know, uh, concentrated barn operation. Then you have, quote, cage-free eggs um, where, you know, the animals at least are not in a cage. Um, you know, they're, they're also technically in a very large barn, very concentrated then you have organic eggs, um, which are produced under the USDA organic standards, which governs the type of feed they can use, uh, some of the other conditions um, used in the raising of the hens. And then you have a small but growing specialty egg uh, you know, category, particularly called either regenerative or pasture-raised, um, very small market segment mm. um, where the, the hens actually get to go outdoors. And a lot of organic and cage-free operations enable outdoor access too. Uh, but the pasture raised, you know, regenerative, um, usually already the most expensive, really emphasize. And all these types of eggs, all these types of hens, they eat feed. You know, and the pasture raised, the outdoor um, hens actually eat a little less feed as a percentage because they're actually grazing on grass and they're eating bugs and worms, which is why when you, you look at one of those types of eggs, the yolk is like sometimes bright orange as opposed to really? kind of a pasty yellow for, um, you know, most conventional or even a lot of organic eggs where they're mostly indoors eating uh, corn and soy feed all day. Well, Errol, as you're talking about the, all these different types of eggs and preferences, is that uh, examples of a segmentation out in the market that you wrote about? Yeah, that's part of the category segment, segmentation. And, you know, these different attributes, um, you know, these different production methods lead to different price points. I mean, all we've talked about so far is what's going on in the farm gate, right? Um, but those are, 
two of the main influences there as well. You know, and the, one of the things that I also emphasize a lot in my writing are what we call externalities of cost. Um, you know, in, in this country, we don't really regulate pollution very well. Um, you know, and so when you look at the runoff from farms and you look at, you know, herbicide or pesticide drift, uh, you know, when you look at fertilizers spilling into the Gulf of Mexico, we've got a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico the size of New Jersey, no disrespect to New Jersey. Um, you know, and that's all coming <laughs> from runoff from mostly animal agriculture and large scale corn and soy monocrops. That is a cost externality that does not get factored into the price that moves up the value chain. So that's something else that I've written about quite a bit too, um, because a lot of production methods are trying to do more true cost pricing. And for the most part, 99% of eggs probably don't have a true cost. Although I would say a lot of the really expensive organic and regenerative stuff is attempting to. So that's just something else to consider uh, is the Mm. cost externalities that we don't take into account. Um, And, you know, I would say one of the internalities that we are taking into account now is profitability. Um, And it it just got revealed by Farm Action, which is a nonprofit. And this is something I didn't even know. Um, I know I know how concentrated the conventional egg market is. There's maybe a you know a dozen companies that control about half the market, so it's not too concentrated. But one of the main egg suppliers, CalMain, apparently had a not only a 110 percent increase in profits uh, in sales, but a 600 percent increase in profits. Right, and so when we talk wow. about like sort of the connection between profiteering and price gouging, you know they're responsible for maybe 20 percent of overall egg sales. So I would actually counter that they are not responsible for what's going on in the category. They have, however, taken advantage of the category and really host consumers of their own products by raising, once again, retail price above the cost of of production so that they've gleaned additional margin. But for the most part, you've got these very real world uh, impacts of the supply chain that are, you know, governing these price increases, which aren't going to last, by the way. I mean, you know, when, hens take, you know, you got to grow out hens for maybe 18, 20 weeks for them to be able to lay eggs. So as long as the uh, rate of adding flocks to the supply chain uh, is higher than the rate of coals, you'll start seeing more and more eggs come into the marketplace. And the other thing I want to point out is that the supply chain for eggs is super squirrely. I'll just say that. It's just like people <laughs> trade eggs, they move <laughs> eggs around. You know, when they say farm fresh, you know, hopefully there's traceability that they know where the eggs actually came from. One of the things that I worked on at Whole Foods, um, and I've actually consulted for some other retailers and brands, is full traceability and tracking the eggs. Sure. We developed a standard when I was there of tracking the eggs from farm to shelf, like it had to happen. We had to know where the eggs came from, which is not only a food service, food, I'm sorry, a food safety issue, um, you know, but you know, it's a customer service issue too, to be able sure. to actually say that. So eggs get traded a lot too and moved around, which is sometimes a problem uh, when there's recalls. Man, uh, provenance. If Greg White was here, he would say provenance. Um, all right, so feed, hens, type of eggs, externalities. I don't know if I can say that. <laughs> that and internalities. Uh, all good. Um, before we move, so all of this kind of speaks to factors and the layers that go into all the pricing. Um because you just mentioned that uh, kind of a forward-looking comment there about where we're going. Before we get there, anything else that we need to add to this list about what goes into pricing for eggs? Yeah, I got a few more, so bear with me. Please do, yeah. Um, So the eggs have to get packed uh, into cartons. Sometimes that's done on farm, you know, for a smaller operation. Um, you know, I've, I've spent some time at, uh, Jeremiah Cunningham's world best eggs here in Austin, um, when they were out, out in Elgin and I've watched them pack eggs. I've also been to some larger facilities where the eggs get shipped from these farms. They get, they get picked up in these, you know, these, these bigger trays and then they get packed in an off offsite facility. So there is a cost associated with that too. You know, there's the transportation, obviously fuel costs have come down, but they're still relatively high. And then you have labor costs. Uh, yep. So the labor costs overall are a pretty low percentage um, of the of the cost overall. And once again, another externality would be if you are not um, paying your workers a living wage or you are hiring as what's happened in the meat industry recently, or a lot, I should say, is trafficking or underpaying employees. Mm-hmm. Like I think J- JBS just got nailed for that. Uh, again, um, hiring underage immigrant kids to uh, mm-hmm. pack meat. In the eggs uh, industry, we haven't seen as much of that. We haven't heard as much of that. So, um, 
all in all, though, that labor is a big part of having to pack the eggs. And so there is a markup associated with that, right? And so once the eggs are packed, there's a higher cost that's come from, you know, the farm gate price, the transportation, now the packing, right? So once it's packed into your convenient 12 or 6 or 18 count cartons uh, here in the United States, for those of you in Europe or elsewhere, that's we, we pack our eggs in odd numbers. <laughs> um, and we wash our eggs too for our you know European listeners. They don't wash their eggs, which is why they're shelf stable in mm. Europe, uh, which I discovered when I was working in Europe several years ago. And um, then the eggs are either picked up or shipped to a wholesaler. Now, wholesale is a um, very interesting, complex, mostly invisible uh, part of the supply chain, except when you're on the highway and you drive by a truck and you see either uh, CNS uh, or UNFI or, or Cahey um, or McLean or uh, Spartan Nash. I think I've named all the big ones. Or smaller smaller wholesalers, um, you know, give a... A shout out to uh, Chex Foods uh, in uh, in the Northeast or mm. um, DPI in the Mid Atlantic. These are wholesalers, and what they do is they are the go between from supplier to retailer, and they have a markup, uh, particularly um, for retail. I'm sorry for wholesalers that have a labor pr- proportion of their their service where they're actually stocking product as well. A lot of mm-hmm. smaller wholesalers, particularly in New York City, um, like Dora's Natural or um, um, you know, rainforest distribution, they also stock or merchandise product. But the larger ones like a UNFI or a CNS are just about a truck. It's just the truck taking it from their facility. So the eggs go to a wholesaler. Um, they're in that facility and, you know, with you know, just in time and, you know, other supply chain methods and the fact that eggs are still perishable, they are rotated right. quickly first in, first out, um, hopefully and eventually end up on a truck to a retailer, right? And so there's a cost associated with wholesale. And it's between 10 and 30%. It's between 5 and 30% even. Mm. If, you, if you're talking about like the most efficient types of wholesale that like um, you know, Walmart or Kroger are or, or doing in terms of their own internal wholesale, because a lot of larger retailers do their own self-distribution. And then a lot of mid-sized retailers are still able to do their own perishables distribution, which I don't want to get into the math of why you know perishable some perishable <laughs> products are easier to self distribute. I'll just say it happens. Um, so you have the wholesale markup, right? Then um, the brand gets to the retailer, and retail markups uh, or margins in the egg category can range from you know not too many loss leader. There are some there can be some loss leader to low single digit margins. You know depending on how competitive the category is to up to 40 percent margin or markup, depending on how you want to calculate it. Um, Google margin to markup calculator in your spare time. I used to keep that <laughs> formula on my desk at Whole Foods. <laughs> Love it. Anyway, so you have a retail markup um, that could be between you know zero and 40 points. And you never know that as a consumer. You don't know what the wholesale price is, and you don't know what the um, retail price, uh, sure. price margin equation is. And it could vastly impact the price of eggs to you if the mar- if you know a retailer is getting eggs at you know at their back door for three dollars and decides oh I have to compete and just sell this at cost it's three dollars or if they're saying oh I could plug a you know a thirty percent markup to it well it's a four dollar egg right etc um, and so the retailer margin markup is a huge piece of why egg prices I I I, I say mostly arbitrary between the externalities and the retail price mm-hmm. egg pricing is all over the place um, and it's like that I would say for most categories now another piece I didn't talk about is the brand itself and how the brand uh, does business or or yeah. the marketer like Type whether it's Cal Maine yeah yeah, yeah yeah what you see on the label you know it's horizon organic or it's vital farms um, or it's handsome Brook or uh, Pete and Jerry's I'm naming all my favorite egg companies um, <laughs> Etc. Or it's a it's a simple truth, or a Lucerne, or three six five, or Kirkland, right? Those last four are actually store brands. So this is where um, the company, the retailer itself, um, contracts directly for the eggs. Usually at a, at a annualized price, they usually get annual contracts. Um, it's what we call dead net um, or EDLP, like it's an everyday low price. Um, and it's usually the best price in the category. These are your store brand or private label. 
However, all the other companies that I just mentioned, some of whom actually do private label too, some of whom don't, and some of whom are just marketers. Mm-hmm. Um, they're just a label. Like, like Horizon is a marketer. Organic Valley is a marketer. You know, they, they get the eggs from their either Organic Valley, their, their cooperative member farms, or Horizon, you know, contracts out for eggs from, uh, from, from growers, et cetera. So these types of third-party brands, consumer packaged goods companies, have their own margin associated. And this margin usually gets plugged in after the farm gate price. Mm. Um, and, you know, depending on the brand, they're putting in a, you know, their own 40 points, sometimes more, you know, sometimes a little less if they run a little more efficiently. And that, that mm. has to pay for their own overhead, their own labor, their own, you know, general administrative costs. But they also have trade spend mm. in the industry. Um, Trade spend is that part of the budget for food brands that is then accrued for and plugged back into the retail price to give you intermittent sale pricing, mm. promotional pricing, coupons, or to pay for wholesale or marketing, you know, wholesale flyers or, um, you know, wholesale shrink, <laughs> wholesale mm. deductions. There's a whole other, you know, kind of you know, really complex and gives you a headache if you think about it too much of how wholesale billings work to to brands, but also how the brands manage their um, promotional pricing with retailers. And you know, you don't see eggs on sale too much, but occasionally you do. Well that right. is through an accrued trade spend. So the reason why I mentioned trade spend, you know, all these things that I'm talking about are, are massive industries. You know, grocery retail, eight hundred thirty billion dollars a year, mm. you know, of which Walmart and Kroger control, you know, close to thirty percent. Mm. Um Wholesale, very large industry. CPG, very large industry. Trade spend, sort of at the intersection of all this, um, is like $200 billion a year industry. Private label, store brands, $120 billion plus a year industry, right? So th- these are not all insignificant factors in our economy, but also in terms of when you plug in pennies across the value chain right. from Farmgate, to packing, to wholesale, you know, with the brand, then to retail, it all adds up to the wackadoo price that you see on shelf. Well, and uh, so, there's, so as, as you walk just through all that, most of our listeners will pick up that there's a ton more complexity than we all ever imagined in the egg industry. So let me ask you this. I'm, I want to I try to shoot for the 80-20. Not that the math works up like that, but for most of our listeners that are here in the States that may go to one of the big uh, grocery retailers that you mentioned, and, um, and well, what's the biggest category? So what's the one biggest category for egg sales, would you say, Errol? I mean, um, still the majority of egg sales are conventional factory farm-raised. You know, okay. Concentrated animal feedlots are highly efficient, highly externalized, but also like just the productivity, the, the sheer caloric value of the amount of eggs. And then the next one down would be cage free conventional. Okay. So um, that where first you just see something cage free and then organic. So. Okay. So that first one, which is uh, sounds like that's what the majority or maybe at least the plurality of consumers here in the states are are, are going out to buy and they're seeing the price stickers. We walk through a variety of factors and and the layers that go into it. it's amazing. Next time we're going to do this in person and we're going to grab a whiteboard and we're all going to get a certification thanks to Errol Schweizer about <laughs> the complexities of the egg industry. But speaking to that, at least that plurality, if not a majority, what's the single biggest factor out of all of those and what's going to bring it down? What's going to bring it back down? Even if we don't get back to where we were, say, a year, 18 months ago, What's going to bring that down to at least a more, I'm not going to say reasonable, right? Because pricing is all relative, but get it closer to what we were paying. What are the, what are the answers to those two questions, you think? Yeah, it's just the prevention of avian flu, which um, I, I would definitely be very um, circumspect about. If you've ever read um epidemiologist named Rob Wallace, he has a book called Big Farms Make Big Flu, where he's... Mm. Um, you know, pretty thoroughly documented how, you know, factory farming gives rise to uh, these types of uh, animal uh, pandemics. Um, mm-hmm. So I, I, I hope um, that we see flocks recover in order to bring food prices down. Because, you know, ultimately, 
you know, we need to talk about a transition in our food system, but it needs to be a just transition in mm. terms of sustainability. Um, and what we have with these types of pandemics, supply chain, now avian flu, these are unjust transitions. It's unfair, particularly to cash-strapped consumers, folks who are on SNAP or WIC, which are 40 million consumers um, are on, on SNAP. You know, it's, I estimate about 15, 10 to 15% of national annual retail sales is SNAP. Um, so all this food inflation has really hurt, uh, folks with the least amount of money, but then the, re- you know, the rest of us who have varying levels of income are also paying a lot more. And so the main thing is the recovery of the flocks. Right. Uh, but then maybe we should start thinking of like, can we do things differently? <laughs> can we do things better so that, you know, these large operations, um, do we need operations this large and dense? Can we decentralize mm. Um, hen and egg production, particularly make it more humane. I mean, just the sheer inhumanity uh, and cruelty of, of culling 60 million birds, right? I have, I have some eggs because I got a couple acres. Um, I have hens. I have seven hens. Okay. And we've, we've, you know, we keep our hens for years. Like I personally, I don't think they're very cuddly creatures. They're essentially <laughs> dinosaurs. They're, 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 they're reptiles with feathers. Um, but it, it's kind of nice to have them, not only for, for waste disposal. You know, they eat my compost and they eat my leftovers. But I get eggs, right? But I also go to the store and I buy a lot of eggs. Right. Um, and it's been painful to watch the egg prices go up from 4 and $5 to 10 11 12 13 primarily right. due to the biological effects of how we create these concentrated animal feedlots um, as the main factor in creating calories for the, for the country in animal yep. products, right? And then I'll also say like a lot of folks have tried plant-based. Um, I, I just don't think it's an you know, apples to apples. I think you can and should eat more vegetables and you should eat more healthy food. Um, produce for a while, pricing was steady and it's only recently that we've seen produce uh, prices come up. I'm not sure if a lot of the processed plant-based foods are a good analog to eggs, hmm. primarily due to the quality and type of protein and the caloric density and the nutrition content. Um, and then, you know, when, you, when after that, you're talking about other types of, of food stuff. So, we, we need to look at how we can expand more sustainable, um, animal compassionate, safe egg production and decentralize away from these factory farm feedlots, which are the cause mm. of avian flu influenza. When you raise animals in these sort of dense operating environments, like I said, you get one bird and they're taking right. out the whole flock. Wow. That is the only way they're going to stop it. And then obviously feed prices. And that is a whole separate conversation about um, grain and commodity markets and why it's essentially a casino economy and how we can get better control on, on grain and feed prices. Yeah. Um, I tell you, so, all right. So if I'm, if I'm tracking you with you, uh, in the short term, we got to get a handle on the, the massive avian flu outbreak that we've seen that's cost us 60 million birds. Uh, and, and that's just the U is that this just the U S poultry industry? I'm just talking about U S yeah. U S wow. centric conversation all right. right now. So we got to no, get a right. handle on that. And is that, is that, would you say that's getting better, Errol? I mean, are we, are we, at I've the- heard that flocks are recovering. The okay. USDA is saying that I've been reading other blogs. I've been reading some ag economists saying that the flocks are starting to recover. Okay. But that's remember great. it's an 18 weeks right. cycle. Um, and so you're thinking you're, you're talking about 36 or 54 weeks in terms of, you know, staggered, you know, when those eggs actually hit the market and start influencing uh, supply quantities. And this is one of those categories where I think what you're going to see across much of the grocery store with the price increases is suppliers are going to be very hesitant to lower prices. Retailers are going to be very hesitant to right. lower prices. In eggs, though, you're going to see the price is going to come down. Okay. And it's going to come down, I, I would say, if the flocks recover you know, over the next six to nine months. Uh, it'll probably be at least a year before we have any sensible egg pricing. Again. Okay. Wonderful. All right. Perfect. You read my mind there. So, um, yeah, quick, quick to raise those prices. And then drop them slow. <laughs> so they, they go maximize. up like a bullet. They come down like a feather. I think yes. that's actually a saying in uh, economics. Uh, all right. So and, you know, it's the same thing with most products because when supplier prices come down, p- particularly one measure of inflation, the producer price increase. Because when we're talking about inflation, we're mostly talking about the CPI, the consumer price or price inflation. That is what people pay at the store. But what suppliers are actually paying, you know, the PPI. Could if that higher. starts coming down and you don't see the CPI coming down, that means you're, you know, that's the profit margin. Mm. But also, um, it also will be plugged into different 
retail tricks and maneuvers. Like they may start uh, doing different pack sizes or they may put that difference into uh, more promotional pricing, more trade spend, or you'll see some retailers want to negotiate EDLP and stop doing promotions so they could show that lower price. Mm. And this is once again over the next you know couple of years, if we start seeing prices A level out and B deflationary, it'll come down like a feather, but it'll be really scattershot. It won't be as clear because there's all these different ways that companies, CPG and retail, are, are going to manage that deflation to protect their margins. Mm. All right, so the good news here to our listeners, now that we're all a lot more educated on all the, again, all the complexities that go into the egg industry, I've ne- I'll, I'll never look at an egg the quite the same way, Errol. And I really appreciate that because well, with information comes power. Um, so six to nine months is the outlook for, for getting things turned around and getting these prices to come back down like a feather, if I heard you right, especially especially in the conventional market, right, which is the – the uh, the biggest, or at least the plurality vast of majority, yeah, okay, vast majority Excellent. of eggs are conventional factory farm eggs, and then you have cage free, and then organic, uh, and then a very small segment of you know quote pasture raised, maybe okay. less than ten percent. All right. So as we start to wind down our time here with Errol Schweizer, um, you've already given us kind of you've already broken out uh, your crystal ball and given us kind of what to expect. Is there anything one other thing? And putting the transformation, I think if fee doesn't uh, necess- uh, uh, need another uh, dedicated conversation, probably the transformation that needs to take place in the food industry, which you're speaking to and advocating for, deserves a separate conversation as well. Putting those things aside, what else, what, what, is there anything else that comes to mind that you're expecting to see as we get further into 2023 when it comes to the food industry? Yeah, I wrote a forward-looking piece uh, for Forbes a couple of weeks back of things that I'm um, thinking that, you know, um, the food industry is going to be very erratic. Um, there's, you know, a lot of conversation about, you know, ongoing inflation. Um, it's going to start hitting the retailers hard. I, I've actually been saying re- food retail is already in a recession because the dollar sales growth has far outpaced the unit turns. Mm-hmm. This is the, once again, the unit economics. The units have cycled either negative or low single digits for a lot of larger retailers, but also uh, a lot of smaller ones that I've spoken to. So, you know, that's that's really... Um, a big deal for the next, you know, you know, six, nine months in terms of how retailers navigate um, this, where consumers have hit their limit on what they could actually spend and they're buying sure. less or, you know, they're going to dollar stores, they're going to discounters um, right. or they're cutting back or they're going to the food bank, you know, 50 right. million Americans use food banks, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, there's no shame in it. You know, everybody's yeah. feeling this pain. And, you know, like I said, 40 million Americans on SNAP. Mm. Um, which, you know, goes that mo- money mo- mo- majority goes to grocery stores. So yep. this is, this is, you know, counterbalanced by there's still a high level of consumer savings. People still have some money. Um, while wage rates haven't kept up with inflation, they have mostly gone up. I think it's like four and a half points. Um, you know, you still see, um, a lot of job growth. The economy continues to add jobs. So I don't mean to like rain on the parade here. It is tough and it's, it's chaotic, but there is still, I think a counterbalance here. And then uh, something that I've written about pretty extensively is I think the federal reserves moves on interest rates are callous and different. And uh, what I call borderline Malthusian in terms Mm. of, you know, the sort of social Darwinism, because essentially what they want to do, you know, they want to slow down the economy by putting people out of work, by making it harder to borrow, by making it harder for companies to grow. Um, And I I think it's a really um, foul way to Mm. manage something that, it's not even gonna. It's not even gonna affect food prices. Like there's actually no, no connection between the interest rate hikes and the CPI. I'll just put. I'll I'll put that on the table and say, dumb idea. Stop doing it, and either, <laughs> uh, either break up the Fed or put them under some sort of oversight. Like they uh, need adult supervision because it's right. essentially bankers working for bankers. Sorry, I'm op- <laughs> that's a little bit of an op-ed. But I think some of the other things that are continue to be, I think, just good news. Um, you know, I'm seeing a lot more continued interest in regenerative and agroecological farming methods like, you know, sustainability, you know, beyond sustainability. Um, I think there's still a lot of interest in creating fair um, and ethical supply chains like consumers continue to buy those foods. Organic has stayed strong. I'm still a big fan of the organic label. And then I think a lot of people are thinking about animal welfare with this like, oh, wow, did we just put down 60 million hens? Mm-hmm. Like even... Not, not even saying that you're going full vegan, which I don't endorse, um, but just thinking about 
should your food suffer in order to mm. make food for you? And well, I don't know, maybe not, you know? And that's the other thing is that I think the supply chain issues, the continued pricing issues has woken up a lot more consumers, particularly younger consumers who are, you know, really coming to this, this sort of ethical, uh, you know, food supply chain um, in much greater percentage than even people our age who I think worked really hard to create this sort of uh, industry. Um, but they're seeing like, oh, maybe we should be doing some things differently. And I think that's going to continue as well. And I think that's mm. a good thing. But, and then finally, um, you know, I just want to point this out, like, you know, corporate, private sector, um, folks like myself, we have, a, we have a monopoly on pricing. We are the only ones who set pricing. I'm sorry. Consu- cons- consumer trends, supply demand, you know, price signals, all we're talking about are still various ways that the market interacts. And the market mm-hmm. is highly consolidated. There's a lot of imbalances in the market. There's cost externalities like I've talked about. Um, and I've put that out there that we probably need, you know, at least some sort of traffic cop role for the public sector when it comes to pricing to prevent this type of price gouging, profiteering, and skyrocketing prices. Mm. Because markets are really good at certain things. They're, they could be very highly efficient, very highly productive. But these last few years have been a real black eye on the performance of markets to guarantee a safe, cheap, convenient, abundant food supply, which ultimately I, we still need but maybe not the way we're doing it now. And so I've started putting out some ideas. I, I'm learning and reading a lot. And it's like, well, how are other ways to manage pricing? You know, are we talking about what you know, Roosevelt did in World War II of price controls? Is there some other middle ground? Mm. Can we use all like the app-based technologies like data to you know, create other ways to manage pricing? What happens in these sort of inflationary or on the other hand, deflationary events to protect right. the margins? But anyway, there's... I think a lot of conversations we should be having about, hey, can we not make these mistakes again? <laughs> right. <laughs> no, absolutely right. And, and and the lessons we've learned in particular in the last two or three years, um, got, we got to keep those in mind, act on them, uh, and let allow those and deliberately enable those to drive good, meaningful change, structural change uh, that you're kind of speaking to across the industry, beyond the food industry. Uh, you and everybody little- should have the right and access to good food. Yeah. And ultimately, that's what, what I'm saying here. And I yep. don't mean to cut you off, but like, no, no. ultimately, that's what the food industry is trying to do. A lot of us have always worked for and have had a lot more difficulty in executing these last few years. And I, right. I think we need to think about how do we do that? Because ultimately, that's what we're here for. Yeah, agreed. Uh, you touched on the workforce uh, shifts. Um, you know, there's lots to have learned from there in the last two or three years that, that uh We've seen some organizations apply. We need more. Uh, we need more uh, change there for sure. Um, and and you mentioned there at the end, consumers are demanding more, more transparency, uh, more ethically sourced products, um, sustainable so sustainability DEI really in in um, in truckloads when it comes to uh, the brands that they buy from and are fans of. So I really appreciate it. Wide ranging. We're gonna have to kick off a new series. Uh, Eight things with Errol. <laughs> and just crank it, tee, tee it up, and <laughs> let you bring the you, unmitigated you can steer folks towards truth. the checkout podcast. I, that's I release right. a couple episodes a month to, to well, deep and, dive on and, this sort of stuff. And that's where that's the final question I want to ask for you because I know you're active, you're doing um, a lot of wonderful writing and other content creation. So your podcast is named the checkout. The checkout, obviously, uh, the retail connotation of the check stand, the uh, you know the checkout counter. Um, Love it. But also, um, for me, it signifies the transactional nature of food relationships. So, folks, obligatory uh, statement. You can get that wherever you get your podcast from. Of course, you can find Errol in a wide variety of publications, such as the Forbes article uh, that he mentioned. And that's just one. Um, and the the website, the Clearinghouse, where, where, where you want to point people to, Errol, to, c- to connect with you. Maybe they want to bring you in and have you keynote at a conference or, or maybe get consulted uh, by you. Who knows? What's a good website for you? It's just errolschweitzerllc.com, and you can email me through the website. Um, I'm also up on LinkedIn. Um, I'm, I'm relatively easy to find, but Errol Schweitzer LLC is, is something I check every day, and it has a good, I think, summary of, of what I do and why. Agreed. And the why is important. Y'all heard that. Plenty of passion speaking to that why here over the last hour. So y'all check that out. Well, you know, to make it easy for you, we're going to include Errol's contact information and including that website and social uh, in the episode notes. So y'all look for that. You're one click away from connecting 
with the one and only Errol Schweitzer. Errol, really appreciate uh, the knowledge bomb you dropped on us here today, not just on eggs, big big chunk of that, but the food industry in general. It is, it is marvelous. And what you opened on, on the front end, is most people have no idea how we get and what, what's, what's behind the food that we buy and consume here in the States. I completely agree with you. We, um, you know, have a responsibility to create a better food system together. Um, and we live in an industrial society with an industrial food system. Uh, but we also have, you know, plenty of other options that we're, you know, trying to grow that are, you know, maybe a little, little fringe, a little trendy. And I think we should continue to work together to figure out better ways to uh, grow, uh, produce, distribute retail food uh, that are more sustainable, ethical, tasty, caloric, and nutrient dense. Those Works are for fun. everybody. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, Errol Schweitzer, I really appreciate uh, your time here today. Uh, uh, to our listeners, uh, hopefully you enjoyed it. Errol, uh, really, uh, thanks for your time. Enlightened, informative, intriguing, and inspiring in many ways. And we look to have you back, Errol. My pleasure. I love this podcast. Love what you folks are doing. Thanks for having me on. You bet. Okay, folks, uh, again, talking with Errol Schweitzer today. Uh, hopefully you all enjoyed, to our listeners, this episode and learned as much. I don't know, I've got about 17 pages of notes over here. Uh, from Errol as much as I did. Uh, of course, you can find Supply Chain Now wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, find us on YouTube. We're really easy to engage and participate in our programming there. But whatever you do, it's a lot of what you heard Errol talk about today. Steeds, not words. Take action, right? Lend a helping hand. Let's drive change together. But on behalf of our entire team here at Supply Chain Now, Scott Luton challenging you to do good, to get forward, and to be the change. With that said, we'll see you next time right back here at Supply Chain Now. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being a part of our Supply Chain Now community. Check out all of our programming at SupplyChainNow.com and make sure you subscribe to Supply Chain Now anywhere you listen to podcasts. And follow us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Instagram. See you next time on Supply Chain Now. Supply Chain Now.